Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone watching tonight on Facebook and YouTube. This is episode 97 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we continue our features on the 12 planes of Christmas. Tonight, the Buckeye Wings PT-26, and we'll talk more about not only the PT-26, but uh, really a remarkable growth story of uh, this one of the brand new wings of the uh, Commemorative Air Force. I'm looking forward to it. But before we get started, if you haven't uh, already done so, please uh, take a second, click that uh, like, share, or follow us button, or subscribe if you're on YouTube, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to follow us. If you do subscribe on YouTube, make sure you click that little bell icon, and then you'll get notifications uh, whenever we have a, a new episode of Warbird Tube or any of the uh, CAF media videos that uh, are loaded up uh, throughout the week. Right now, we would like to uh, welcome in uh, Steve Koenig, who is the uh, Buckeye Wings leader and a couple of other folks he's got with him tonight and Steve go ahead and take it away thanks Steve sitting next to me is Dave Holden our maintenance officer uh, we're in our big beautiful uh, Sky Vista hangar where the airplane is ready to undergo maintenance and behind us is Jim Corso who is one of our bigger supporters and volunteers uh, he's been at just about every single recruiting event we've had and uh, when I told him we were doing this tonight he said he wanted to come in and be a part of the show so uh, Jim's Excellent. in the background there uh, I think uh, the way we're going to start this, Steve, is you already mentioned it, growth and new wing. Uh, we'd like to start by showing a video uh, with one of the members who is really the genesis for how the wing started, Kevin Corderon. He's uh, currently uh, at work out in California, but before he left, we recorded this video that gives everybody an idea for how and why the Ohio Buckeye wing is up here in Marysville, Ohio. This is Steve Koenig, the Buckeye lead, with Kevin Quarteron, the Buckeye XO, and we are talking today about how the wing started. And the reason I'm here with Kevin is because Kevin actually is the reason the wing was founded here at Marysville when they were discussing starting a new wing as a part of the new wing initiative. So Kevin, what brought you to Marysville? So used to base some of the, the uh, Air Base Georgia aircraft here in between events like Oshkosh and Thunder Over Michigan and, and what have you. So as it turns out, I was actually flying the PT-19 down in Georgia and there was evidently some sort of challenge detected with the fuel pump in the Corsair, which was you know parked here at Marysville. So I actually put a Corsair fuel pump in my roller bag somehow got it through you know airport security and then came here and I met Dave Holden up here um, you know with the fuel pump and got talking to Dave and he was really really capable around warbirds right he'd done a whole bunch of recip work and whatnot so this is like you're talking summer of uh, 2019 maybe 20 yeah 2019 2018 thereabouts thereabouts okay. and you were and you were using Marysville just because it was so centrally located to a number of air shows that the Georgia base uh, Warbirds were going to be operating in that summer. Absolutely, it's okay. a great facility, big runway, and and Dave has a high knowledge of um, you know from his FBO and maintenance shop of you know working on on reciprocating engines and just kind of helping out in general. Had a tow bar and whatnot to kind of get us around. So looked to be a great place. Okay, so you guys fix the airplane. Summer's done. Uh, I guess then commemorative Air Force started the initiative for new wings mm -hmm. what in the summer of or i don't know 2021 2022 yeah, during like covid yeah. uh, you know yeah. what's the story behind that then yeah so david oliver and and a, and a, and a team from cfhq started to shape a, a new wing initiative and when i heard about this i thought wow that's really great you know get requisite number of members together you know, have a facility, and then, you know, I thought back to all of the, the great experience that we had with, you know, Dave Holden and Sky Vista here at Marysville and said, what a, what a perfect place to have a CAF wing. Big runway, grass runway, big hangars, and, and just a really great knowledgeable team around aircraft maintenance. Okay, so then you decided 
I'm going to talk to Dave about this. That was uh, was that uh, like December, January of 2021, I guess. Yeah, it was roughly. Yeah, that was uh, just kind of the, the latter part of, of 2021. I started to think about, wow, this would be a really great venue to have a wing, especially in the birthplace of aviation. So our first meeting, as I recall, was uh, January, and it was just a little get together where you introduce yourself to myself, uh, John Solinger, the operations officer. Uh, Dave was there, and I think Dean Dayton was also there. I think that was the the first four, if you will, first five of us in the wing. And uh, yeah, it was kind of an inauspicious beginning, and uh, but everybody kind of got together, and then it just literally, pardon the expression about the snowflakes, it snowballed from there. And we you know managed to think add a lot of great people to our team. It's just been a great experience. And besides helping to form the wing and and putting the initiative together. You also kind of found the airplane, too. Now, how, how did that come about? Yeah, Rocky's one of the leads on the air power tour for the B-29, B-24. And it, it was kind of fortuitous how it happened because I'd been talking to David. And then, you know, I think con- at, at the same time, David got a, a call from Rocky and said, hey, you know, we ran into this fella that wants to do something with this just absolutely pristine PT-26. And David helped connect the dots. And then, you know, all of a sudden we got the phone call and said, hey, there's a PT-26 coming here. And I was like, what? You know, so it all came together really great. And I think that's really indicative of the type of teamwork that the CAF is all about. Well, thanks for letting us know the startup story here for the wing and uh, appreciate the time this morning. And we'll probably have a few more of these going on through 12 Days of Christmas. Look forward to it. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Well, we have the uh, crew from the Buckeye Wing uh, with us, and uh, we are heard in the video about uh, some of the outstanding things that have happened so far, but uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into uh, some of the, the growth that's uh, taken place within the wing. This sure. picture was taken, believe it or not, in August. Uh, we, were only, we were only about uh, four or five months old at that point, and we had approximately 30 members, and it's uh, one of the few actual group photographs we've taken thus far. Uh, I, I thought it was a good place to start because you can see the enthusiasm, the diversity, uh, and, as well as the styles uh, of everybody involved. Uh, it, with the next slide, uh, it kind of gives you the history of growth here uh, at the wing. And without reading the slide, uh, we started in a cold, snowy meeting, just a few of us. We quickly grew in size. By May, we had to 30 members, and getting the airplane was miraculous. It was two days, three days of conversations with uh, Dave Oliver and Kevin. Uh, a day later, it was, let's go up and take a look at the airplane. Dave Oliver says, we'll meet you up there. That afternoon, Dave Oliver is flying that airplane down to the airport, and we were had our first child, if you will. Uh, and uh, Dave Holden and I and uh, Jim and uh, two other people were at the field, and we were all like brand new parents with that plane uh, on the field in May. Uh, so from February to May, 30 members in a plane, and now here we are at the end of the year, uh, we have 40 members, 10 pilot sponsors, and we've put, I think, 25 or 30 hours on a plane, but unfortunately we had maintenance challenges and uh, we had to stop where we were at. Part of the growth would be our pilots and our CFIs. And that would be the next slide for you, Steve. Uh, we have Christine Morton, who also is an FAA examiner. John Solinger up at the top, waving from the back seat there uh, when he was actually taking his check ride and Andy Jones, and we're from different parts of the state, and they were able to get themselves qualified uh, prior to the airplane going down. The nice thing about CAF, you're never alone. We actually had the Indiana wing, uh, Laura Stance and Nick Borland came and helped us get everybody qualified, the the CFIs. And of course we had Kevin Quarterun, you know, the the guy that made the wing happen, he got himself qualified. So we had him as one pilot, and uh, the two CFIs, and uh, excuse me, three CFIs to fly the airplane through the summer to the different events. If you go to the training slide, we had a a lot of support because not only is Kevin a force of nature, Kevin knows everybody in CAF. So he talked Taylor Stevenson into uh, doing some training with us in the classroom, uh, courtesy of great Wi-Fi and connectivity. Uh, Bob Heath showed up for another class we had when we were doing pilot training. And then, of course, uh, we've done the first aid training, hands-on training, as well as uh, everybody's wonderful thoughts of PowerPoint and sitting through PowerPoint presentation after presentation to learn about the plane. One of the other things we've been doing with the member rides is uh, uh, 
again, Kevin, uh, being one of the few pilots to, to qualify before the plane broke, uh, one of Kevin's big loves is to give uh, member rides. So he would coordinate on most Saturdays or Sundays to try to take out uh, each of the members of the wing uh, when he was going to go out and do a flight uh, himself. So just about everybody that became a member has either on the list or has gotten a ride uh, in the airplane. And, and Jim would attest to how much fun it is getting in the airplane and having a ride uh, if, if I'd give him the mic. But I told him he's not allowed to talk. He's allowed <laughs> to just wave and, and, and sing along. <laughs> so besides the member rides, we, we tried to stay fairly busy as well. The Air Power Tour came through Ohio. Uh, we are able to take the airplane down to Cincinnati uh, with our display. We were then able to go into uh, Springfield, and I believe we took the airplane there as well. Uh, the plane broke. We didn't get up to Mansfield. Uh, we had an issue, uh, a ground incident that we had to deal with, a uh, minor one, but we didn't have the plane available for that. So we were up in Mansfield. So uh, at each of the stops uh, that the Air Power Tour came in, we were able to set up shop. Uh, which not only helped to advertise the fact that there was an Ohio wing, but at each of the stops, I believe we actually got between uh, one and two new members to sign up as a part of the wing, which again has helped our growth. Well, so and can, just, just, be, you know, just, just, just for a second here, second here the, uh, the, uh, the Air Power the, Tour, how did you get involved in, in that? With, and for those not familiar with it, it's the uh, B-29, B-24 squadron. They travel all over the country, uh, spring, summer, and fall, but uh, they also uh, bring on some of the local uh, wings and squadrons as well to help them out. But how did you get involved? Uh, so again, um, believe it or not, the leadership team here, we're, we're actually relatively new to CAF. Right. Uh, so Kevin, being a longtime member, uh, he, he started out with the uh, Atlanta base, Air Base Atlanta. Um, he, again, seems to know just about everybody. So he actually called up Joe and said, hey, we're coming in uh, to our own. We've got a plane. Is there any chance we can just set up and advertise the fact that we have an Ohio wing? And uh, Joe and the rest of the team with the Air Power Tour were, were more than happy uh, to have us bring the plane down. Uh, because it was static display, uh, there were no real issues for them. And uh, it, it worked great all around. We, we got to meet a whole lot of new people uh, because of it. Um, and, and like I said, the people that, that were at the different stops, uh, those that were aware of the, the commemorative Air Force were actually happy to hear that there was an Ohio wing. And I know that uh, we gave out at least three or four pamphlets uh, with our email addresses on it and the website. And uh, we had a lot of follow-up because we were at those locations with the Air Power Tour. So we've already talked to Joe, and we're hoping that we can make this a regular thing uh, for the wing. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and then, of course, besides the, the, that, here at our local airport, uh, it's a smaller airport with about a 4,200-foot runway. But we have uh, have several fly-ins a year here. And so now having the, the wing here on the field actually made for some really nice events. Uh, so much so that our Oktoberfest event in its second year was large enough that uh, Channel 10 out of Columbus actually came down and they did an interview with us uh, for supporting the fly-in. And it was uh, on the 11 o'clock news, about a minute and a half spot where we got to talk about the wing, uh, about the airport, about the fly-ins. And it was a really nice advertising spot and a really big surprise. Uh, next year, there'll be three more fly-ins that we'll be doing at the airfield here. And again, um, the local community has really embraced the wing. The last part of growth has been our sponsor event. And uh, the uh, company down in Wilmington, Ohio, likes to remain a little bit discreet. So I just call them the company in Wilmington, Ohio. But if, if you, you look up uh, the KILN airport, uh, you'll pretty much know who the, the company is. Uh, one of our members is actually uh, employed down there. Actually, two of them are employed down there. And they invited us to come down and start a dialogue with them. And we found uh, that we could fill a niche for them with a couple of their employee days. So we brought down the PT. And then the other planes you see there are actually member planes that uh, we decided we would just fly down and park our planes on the ramp as well. So we actually supported a, a, an employee golf weekend uh, employee event. And uh, we, we got a really nice donation out of them and then a lot more great advertising to help grow the wing as well. And uh, to kind of finish off, uh, to talk about us and the wing and our background, uh, we've got a short video where we'll take you through a quick tour of both our O Club and our hangar.
Well, I must say I am impressed. Yeah. Uh, there are so many units and squadrons and wings that uh, work for years and never have a facility uh, quite as nice as what you've been able to put uh, together in your first year. So uh, again, congratulations, not only on membership growth, but uh, also the uh, the hangar facility, which always helps. But we also have to talk about the star of the show, and that is your PT-26. Yeah, so right. Uh, we, we dubbed her the Queen Mother, and, and I'll tell the story of the background in a segue here uh, to get into the, the, the normal stuff about a PT. Uh, so uh, Christine was flying the PT, and we were all talking about how does it fly? How do you like flying it? You know, what do you think? And Christine's comment was, you know, you just have to remember that she's just like an old woman like your grandmother. And you just have to, you know, respect the fact that she's going to go at her own pace and she's going to do things the way she wants to do them. And you just have to understand how that's going to work. And I started laughing. And then Christine said, well, why are you laughing? And I said, well, you know, you, you just called her an old lady. And I'm thinking to myself, she's a Royal Canadian Air Force plane, which means she's actually royalty. So if she's an old grandmother, she's actually the queen mother. And Christine laughed and she looked at me and she goes, I think you just nicknamed the airplane. <laughs> so Christine's uh, way to talk about handling the airplane, uh, to me in the comments back and forth, we dubbed her the queen mother because that's how you, that's how the queen mother is, is taking care of you. you. You have to be respectful. You have to be kind. You have to let her do what she wants to do. And at the end of the day, you just kind of guide her around the pattern and she does everything that you want her to do. So the queen mother, uh, our pride and joy, is in fact a PT-26. Uh, the T number is listed as well as the original registration number. Super airplane, ours was built in, in Hagerstown. Uh, the video covers a little bit of this, but we had a really neat story that we discovered uh, thanks to uh, David, um, excuse me, Tony Broadhurst, who is uh, somewhat of the uh, PT guru. The airplane actually, after it was built in December, was flown into the Rickenbacker here in Columbus, Ohio, on, New on Christmas Eve of 1943 and spent the night here. And then on Christmas Day of 1943, it took off and flew uh, out uh, over, into, I think, into Detroit and then into uh, Canada, where the Canadians accepted it as part of their fleet. So uh, she actually has a Columbus route tour, which we're really happy to find out about. Uh, she's built from the time period of, that, uh, of, of mostly airplanes, uh, three different types of materials, wood, steel, aluminum, uh, fabric covering. Uh, our airplane has actually went through a fairly major restoration in uh, 2002 uh, under the supervision of, um, uh, I can't think of Dines' first name, uh, Mark Dines, thank you, out in Pennsylvania. So when we looked at the airplane and picked it up in May, uh, it's been hangered its entire life. Uh, we're now the fifth custodian of the aircraft and um, we, we can't be more pleased. Uh, the Ranger engine, uh, powerful engine, very really strong. Uh, you learn that it doesn't climb very fast when you fly it. And when you look at the instrumentation, which is the next slide, uh, it is a very basic VFR trainer. So you're not going to do a whole lot with it. Ours, thankfully, already has ADS-B in it, which is helpful being next to Columbus. Uh, we are hoping to upgrade with some portable technology to, to get some ADS-B in as well as the out. Uh, and we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, our goals for the campaign. Uh, the electrical system uh, needed a little work. Uh, Dave took care of a couple of small items when we got the aircraft. Uh, we didn't realize it when we got it, but we do have a couple of instruments that, that uh, unfortunately aren't working. Uh, the attitude indicates most of it's in the back seat. And since you fly from the front seat, you know, it's okay to have some things not working in the back. But uh, the attitude indicator in the back doesn't work real well. Uh, the nice, one of the nicer things about this, besides uh, the fact that it's uh, got an electrical system, is it has the starter in it. So on cold January and February uh, mornings, you don't have to worry about getting too cold. Yeah. And um, uh, for the most part, though, it's it's going to be a day, uh, a clear type of day VFR aircraft trainer. Uh, we consider ourselves, if you want, like to go to the next slide, Steve. We really consider ourselves uh, looking at this aircraft. Uh, with its low time, our understanding is it is one of the lowest time PTs out there with uh, under 500 total hours on the airframe. Uh, our, uh, our, our desire, our, our attitude about the aircraft is that we are custodians of history. Uh, so when we're flying this aircraft, uh, everything you make decision-wise is about, of course, safety. 
But the other part of it is, is the respect for the fact that this is a piece of history that you can't replace. So you're not going to, we're not going to be making any type of questionable weather calls on this aircraft. You're only going to go out when it's good weather and when the margins are such where you don't have to be concerned uh, of any type of issues that are, are going to cause any problems whatsoever with the maintenance of the aircraft. And lastly, uh, I, I think we just have a couple beautiful shots uh, of the aircraft that we've taken while she was flying. I think somewhere online, uh, the center one is actually, uh, I believe, in competition for pictures uh, through uh, the CAF and uh, Leah's uh, picture uh, campaign. And uh, I think it's just best to finish off with a, a video of, of uh, the Queen Mother in flight. Uh, and I think uh, that, that'll really sum up uh, the true attitude and, and uh, feelings for the aircraft. Well, it's always great to watch airplanes fly, uh, especially one as, as good looking as as uh, Five Nine Hotel is. Uh, but you uh, do have some things that we talked about a little earlier, but uh, let's get into a little more depth of uh, exactly where the money raised during the 12 planes of Christmas will be going uh, for the airplane. Sure, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave Holden, the maintenance officer. And hopefully between us, you can see some of the new cylinders, but Dave will talk about all the work that needs to be done here. Yeah, so uh, our Ranger engine has about 450 hours total time on it. And uh, one of our members was up flying and had an issue, lost power, and returned back to the field safely. And uh, subsequently, we did a few tests on the engine and found that we have a cracked cylinder. The number five cylinder is cracked. So um, everybody has been really helpful at CAF on the maintenance side leading us down the road to get this fixed. So, and with their uh, insight in this, they're telling us that if you're gonna change one cylinder on a PT, you should change them all. And fortunately, we're able to locate six overhauled cylinders out in California. A uh, gentleman uh, out there drove them out to us, and we have a, two of them sitting here. So we have brand new pistons and overhauled cylinders, and uh, we're gonna get started probably this week, uh, tearing the PT engine apart, and uh, replacing those cylinders. Um, the but, next, but of course, the challenge with the with the Ranger engine is everything's mm -hmm. upside down. So you have to actually pull the engine off, yeah. put it on a special stand, and then rotate it. Yeah. And of course, yeah. all that's all that equipment doesn't exist. So now we're having to fabricate yeah. equipment to make all this work. Yeah, one of our other members is a great fabricator. So he's he's uh, fashioning two engine stands together that. It's going to be a rotisserie so we can flip it upside sure. down yep. or on its side. So uh, the next challenge that we have is our uh, the propeller. We have an original Falcon propeller mm -hmm. here. And yeah, as you can see from the slide there, it's delaminated on the leading edge. So when we do the engine, we're going to pull the prop, send it down to Sensenic, and um, they're going to evaluate it and possibly repair it for us. If not, of course, they have brand new propellers that they're willing to sell us. So we will see how that develops. Um, We'd like to keep the original propeller, though. It's, um, you know, Falcon hasn't been in business for many, many years, so we'd like to keep that one. Uh, and then we'll move on to the uh, the upgrades. Uh, the intercom system in the airplane is not very good, so we'd like to install a high noise um, uh, uh, intercom system so that the pilot and the instructor can communicate better. And then the, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, some ADSB in. Uh, uh, 
you know, like Stratus or something like that, so that we can pick that up on our mobile devices. Um, that that's really about it. Okay. So, okay. so, but when you talk about all that, Steve, you know, it, we kind of mentioned it rapid fire. Well, you know, give you an idea of cost. A okay. cylinder, just to buy a cylinder, is a thousand dollars. That's just for the part. We mm -hmm. so again. Phil, Phil Perdone down at, at headquarters maintenance says, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna pull the engine for one cylinder, you may as well do all six. So great. Now we're at six thousand dollars for those parts. Well then you need the rings, you need all the other parts that go with it. Suddenly just on parts purchases alone, you can be in excess of ten to twelve thousand dollars for the engine. And that doesn't include any maintenance or, or volunteer labor stuff that you need to do it. Again, building the stands. Uh, for the engine to, to rotate it so you can work on it the proper way. Uh, the use of, the, the we're in the big hangar here. This is the Sky Vista FBO hangar today. Um, and, and so, you know, we're getting hangar space out of this for free as opposed to our T hangar where we have the airplane normally based. And it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly um, the airplane costs in just materials alone can skyrocket on something like this. So, we have a goal of $8,500 for the campaign. Uh, we're hoping that that will cover the majority of the, the heavy duty pieces and parts for the engine alone. Uh, that doesn't even get into the other things we mentioned we want to do. So uh, we're hoping to have a very aggressive and successful campaign and, and pay for, if you will, the cylinders and, and most of the major engine pieces. So now we know where the funds will go and into the airplane to uh, get it back and airworthy so it can continue the mission uh, to educate, inspire, and honor. And you have a, another video coming up, Steve. This one is a educational outreach. Tell us a little bit more about that. Again, with the growth we've had, I almost can't you know, tell you all the different people that, that have things to contribute. Uh, the one I do want to focus on is Danielle Reese. Uh, she is actually an Army National Guard Lieutenant Colonel in her real life, but her passion is aviation. And as she'll tell you in the question and answer uh, video we put together, she is loves the whole WASP program. So when she came to CAF, she was actually already collecting WASP items. And when she mentioned the fact that she enjoyed that, we started discussing the fact that CAF actually has, uh, as an education piece and a focal point, is the WASP program itself. So it was a natural fit for Danielle to bring uh, her WASP collection and some of the things she's created uh, to most of the events we would go to for recruiting, which again, the more things you have for people to look at, touch, and 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 you know feel, and when it comes to history, the better your audience, uh, the more people you have coming in that want to talk to you. And so Danielle and and the entire WASP program that she's put together uh, is to the point where we're actually ready to go and offer it to the school systems around here during Women's Appreciation Month if anybody wants us to come into a classroom. And with that and the introduction of Danielle, we can just go right into the video, I think. I'm here this evening with Danielle Reese, CAF Colonel and our in-house WASP expert. And she's gonna talk about the WASP program, the educational efforts we're trying to put on here at the wing. So why don't you to start by telling me about yourself and how you got into the WASP uh, in general. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been an aviation nut for as long as I can remember. Grew up just being fascinated with airplanes, jets, helicopters, flying, all the things. But no one in my family was a pilot and no one in my community was a pilot. We didn't know anybody was a pilot. So getting into aviation was just that bridge too far. It was just something I'd never actually break into. So it wasn't until much later in life that I actually got to start flying. And I put myself through helicopter flight school in 2009. And then just the year, this year I added airplane rating to my private pilot. And those are your three aircraft that we're looking at on the pictures, correct? <laughs> yes. Yep, two ultralights and a home-built experimental. Now, you started into the WASP, so why don't you uh, give us a quick background on, on the WASP, if you will, what they were, for those that don't know, and then uh, tell us about a couple of the, the items that are in the collection that we have the pictures of, and maybe what your favorite item is out of the collection. Yeah, sure. So, how I came to WASP history, or women in, in aviation, and particularly women in military aviation, is kind of a long, complicated, bizarre story. It starts with Indiana Jones and then makes its way to Amelia Earhart. And then an aviatrix book club on Facebook 
led me to a whole bunch of other interesting books, which also led me to the 99s, which I'm also a member of. And so bringing all these layers of history together uh, led me to being particularly interested in women in military aviation as we broke into that role and then learning more about the WASP. So the WASP is a really fascinating, super interesting story in that it was two separate programs started at two separate times by two different women that was later merged um, and then a very brief program that was ended in the December of 44. And at the close of, of the program in December, they made the whole thing top secret. So it wasn't until the 70s that it even became minimally aware out in the world that this thing had even happened. So there's been a lot of work over the years to bring that back to, to the forefront and make it, uh, make it accessible to the world now. So I come to this kind of obscure piece of women's history and women's military history uh, with intense passion about teaching and sharing that and being an advocate and, uh, and a mentor and enabler for those things. So I started building this collection and I have been incredibly blessed to find, stumble on, and acquire some fascinating bits of history. One of the really fascinating things was a stack of books for teaching military pilots in World War II. One of those books is about stellar navigation and in that is an illustration of a particular watch that was designed by Hamilton Watch Company for navigation by stars. I've got that watch wow. and the original case it was made in and it keeps time and it's amazing which is a super cool piece of tangible history but this journey has brought me into uh, learning so much about the actual stories. So when you talk about the most uh, most meaningful thing in the collection is the stories I've picked up from women who actually experienced these things all through, uh, beginning with the WASP, but all through um, military, women breaking into the military aviation community and the challenges they overcame and learning how they dealt with those challenges brings a whole lot of particular relevance to modern day stuff and how we deal with uh, challenges today. So now we're looking at the, I call it the flight training device, made famous with the picture of Amelia Earhart. I'm glad you asked about that one. Uh, in all of this research, I stumbled on this photograph of Amelia Earhart, and I think it was 1932. And she was presenting to a bunch of children and had this wooden model of an airplane that was connected to actual hand controls. And I thought, boy, wouldn't that be fun to have one of those. So after about a month of playing with sketches and drawings to try and figure out how the thing worked, uh, we set about to build a version of it using things I could get from a local hardware store and build it in my living room. So it took about a week to put the thing together and that's what you see in the picture now. It's not a perfect uh, replica of what Earhart used, but it serves the same purpose as she was serving in the 30s that the Army Air Force had a slightly different version of it in the 40s. And then what we've got today is this basic uh, demonstrator of how controls interact with an airplane, but it's also a tremendous amount of fun. And the kids love it, and it's always a big conversation piece at all the different uh, places we've gone. Speaking of recruiting events, how have you been received? And, and can you uh, tell a story about maybe one of your best uh, engagements thus far with the public, sure. with the WASP collection and the program? So living history or having a person who embodies and is a tangible representation of history, makes history and some of the obscure things in our past immediately accessible, tangibly true and relevant, which sparks so much interest and inspires actual action. So youth come to these things and they're immediately full of curiosity and they're just sponges of interesting information. You can just watch that glimmer in their eye about how they can start seeing themselves in some of these places and some of these roles. And that the best interaction so far this year was a time we were at a, at a fly-in and this young girl wanted, she was interested in that flight demonstrator and we sat her down sh started showing her some things and she immediately took like this engineer's sort of perspective to how it worked, wanted to understand all the, the way the cables and the pulleys moved and started talking about how she wanted to fly. And she never knew anybody was a pilot and never thought that a girl could be a pilot. And she started talking about how she wanted to be. Um, so like that inspiration, that conversion of a history thing that's somewhat abstract and you only see pictures of to being something you can touch in real life and then convert that to inspiration to actually be something and change uh, the direction of people's lives. So yeah, it's, it's been an amazing ride to uh, be able to, to connect people with our own history. 
So we're looking at expanding beyond just uh, attending or some demonstrating at fly-ins and air shows and actually taking this to schools to partner groups with the 99s, for example, um, and other youth groups to try and mentor and coach and inspire that next generation of pilots. Well, thank you very much, Danielle. Is there anything else you'd uh, like to close with? Uh, I wanted to really, really con uh, thank the Buckeye Wing for giving me this opportunity and the Commemorative Air Force for being this platform for connecting history with the modern day, connecting history with the next generation and helping us appreciate where we've come, how far we've come and how far we can yet get to. So thank you very much for this opportunity and for, for uh, letting me be on board. Well, that is a, a great program and uh, Danielle is really, you can tell she has enthusiasm not only for the, uh, for the WASP story, but also for aviation in general. And uh, what, a, what a great addition to your, uh, to your group. Yeah, we're we're again we're we've just been so fortunate with the the talent uh, of our members, uh, the enthusiasm of the members, uh, the actual willingness of people to be involved and not just uh, you know show up and and say yeah I'm a member but to actually get get their hands dirty to do things for us. Uh, and this being Ohio, speaking of dirt, you know, we're in that season where you get plenty of sand and salt on the roads because it's going to start snowing. So we thought we would like to close with a little uh, Ohio Buckeye Wing holiday cheer uh, with a parody of the 12 days of Christmas as a way to leave you all with a smile and, and hopefully a happy thought to support uh, not only us, but any of the planes in the 12 planes of Christmas and the CAF in general. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you for, uh, for being a, a part of the uh, webinar tonight and good luck with the fundraising efforts for the PT. Looking forward to seeing it back in the, uh, in the skies. Um, and uh, stick around because you're going to really you're going to really enjoy this 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 Christmas Carol. Uh, it uh, it has all the elements you need. It has enthusiasm. It has airplanes and even some good singing. So with that, we will uh, present that video and wish you all a very merry Christmas and a happy New Year. And thanks for watching tonight on CAF's Warbird Tube. On the first day of Christmas, CAF brought to me a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the second day of Christmas, CAF brought to me an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the third day of Christmas, CAF brought to me Three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the fourth day of Christmas, CAF brought to me four Dayton members, three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the fifth day of Christmas, CAF brought to me Five Nine Hotel Four Dayton members, three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the sixth day of Christmas, CAF brought to me six recruiting events. Five Nine Hotel Four Dayton members, three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the seventh day of Christmas, CAF brought to me seven sales at the online PX6 recruiting events. Five Nine Hotel. Four Dayton members, three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the eighth day of Christmas, CAF brought to me eight volunteer staff officers, seven sales at the online PX6 recruiting events, five nine hotel. Four Dayton members, three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the ninth day of Christmas, CAF brought to me nine online donations, eight volunteer staff officers, seven sales at the online PX6 recruiting events, five nine hotel. Four Dayton members, three CFIs, an officer's club with Wi-Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the 10th 
day of Christmas, CAF brought to me 10 hours of flight time, 9 online donations, 8 volunteer staff officers, 7 sales at the online PX6 recruiting events, 5 9 hotel, 4 Dayton members, 3 CFIs and officers club with Wi Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the 11th day of Christmas, CAF brought to me the 11th plane in the planes of Christmas, 10 hours of flight time, 9 online donations, 8 volunteer staff officers, 7 sales at the online PX, 6 recruiting events, 5 9 hotel, 4 Dayton members, 3 CFIs and officers club with Wi Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. On the 12th day of Christmas, CAF brought to me 12 aircraft sponsors, 11th plane in the planes of Christmas, 10 hours of flight time, 9 online donations, 8 volunteer staff officers, 7 sales at the online PX6 recruiting events, 5 9 hotel. Four Dayton members, three CFIs, and officers club with Wi Fi and a wing lead for the Buckeye Wing. Merry Christmas. <laughs>